inna allahi wa inna allahi rajun, which literally means we all come from God and to God we will all return. Welcome to the Midnight Miracle. Despondent person alive. Like, how do you make somebody want to live? Is there a thing that you can even do for someone like that? Seriously, if someone you love was actively slowly killing themselves, what do you do? You could do something beautiful for those people whenever you can. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, for, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? How do you inspire somebody? To want to live, like, what's the example? I think just by being kind to them, you know. I think one of the closest things that I have, or, um, a situation similar, is um, my friendship with Amy Winehouse, because I had never. <sighs> It, she was at an extreme point of her use at, at that time, you know, and um, you know, she didn't really see a way out, you know. She was wrapped up in it. And um, I just spent time with her as much as I could when I was in Europe, you know, and we were in each other's space. But uh, it was challenging because I, if somebody has an addiction like that, they're only around people that use at that level. So their social circle just immediately it becomes so isolated that if you don't do that, you don't really see them because they're not interested in, you know, it's not, and that doesn't mean that they don't love people or want to see people, but they, you know, they see people in spurs because it's like, you know, they, it's, they're wrapped up in their thing, you know? Everything is about getting back to that. And there's certain people that, you know, they can't be actively in that state around. So if they're generally in that state, more often than not, they just stop being around people. Um, and it's not to say that addicts are not kind to each other in that space too, but you know, the, the focus is always the same. It's kind of kind of very impersonal kind of relationships, you know? They're very surface. So it, it's, it's a rough one, you know what I mean? I think that's why I said, the first thing I said is just to pray for them in like whatever circumstance they're in, that, you know, that they come out of it on the better side. And if they do perish in that way, that you know, that the Creator find mercy on them, you know? Let them perish in the best way possible. Because, you know, I mean, I mean, the fact of the matter is we're all walking in the same direction, you know? Uh, it's how you get there that matters most, you know? And then that's just the beginning. So you just pray. Like you said, Kuala, is uh, you can't control people. People have to be, you know, they have to be motivated from within themselves to make any change or do anything. I'd say, ironically, accept them. Like, people feel accepted without judgment, and everybody comes to a place when they're like, well, maybe this isn't what I want. Maybe there's something to live for, and if you're accepting them and not judging them in that moment, you can talk to them in the moment when they're listening. Yeah, that happened with me with Amy. She was just in the zone one night, and we were staying at the same hotel at the K West, quality. She had a room with all these people, and I was staying downstairs, and she broke out from them, and she said, I just want to hang out with you. So we kicked it, came back to my room, and she uh, whipped out this aluminum foil situation, and I was like, what is that? And she was like, it's gear, basically. 
And I've never been, you know, up close to anybody using hard drugs like that, like, ever. She said, you're not a big drug person, are you? I said, no, no, I'm not. Um, I said, I don't mind that she use drugs, but I mind that she use drugs, you know, hmm. basically. Right, yeah. And uh, I said, I'm not going to judge you. If you feel safe here, and I feel like it was better for me to be that oasis for her because she it was crazy around and she called out for it she was like these people are like i'm high they high and crazy it was like a dude just sitting on the floor it was like it was it was it was out of a movie it was crazy like you know it was the dude just sitting on the floor at the door when i walked in there was like 15 people in there they, i was like is this dude like laying down in the middle of the floor at this party in this hotel i was like wow she had just had to show the height of her success and she was on one so yeah you know I hear what you're saying, Raheem, no judgment. I, 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 I was being candid. And she said something that was interesting to me, too. She said, uh, you know, doing drugs can be a bit boring. She said, because, you know, everybody around, all they want to do is talk about drugs. And she liked hanging out with me because we would talk about other things because we wasn't using drugs together. But at a certain point, Amy would break out because she was either high or she had to go get high, you know? She'd get high and be zoning out and just drift off. Self-professed, profound, till the tips were down. No, you're a gambling And then I saw her one time after that, and she was just kind of like, you know, out of it. And Nas was in town, and she was so, because she was such a Nas fan. And I remember her being like, it was so adorable. And it was so sincere, too. She was like completely starstruck and geeked out. And Nas was honored, too. And they, I think they had birthday around the same time, so. And I was one of the times that I saw her really happy, but she was in a lot of anguish, too, because she was so self-conscious, you know, about, you know, how she looked. And, and you know, the paparazzi at that time, they were, like, really on her. She got really annoyed with that. I don't think she anticipated that either, you know. I met Amy in 2004. Her first record, she was, like, they didn't even really know what to do with it. It was nothing like that that had come out. I mean, it was smart. It was, it was funky. It was, like, you know... I was like, she's a star. star. God bless our, our beloved ones, man. May the creator make their journeys easy, man. And thank the creator for bringing them here to express their gift with us and that we got a record of it. And some of us were even more fortunate to actually be in their presence um, face to face and in the flesh. It's a gift. Amen. 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 in the same direction. It's just how you get there. Oh what condition you get in. And we eternal. People, there's no equal or no sequel. So...
Black Thought is considered a favorite MC by the best MCs in the world. Best people who rap look at Black Thought as like the pinnacle. But those first couple of Roots albums, if Steel sharpens Steel, then Malik B is the steel that sharpened Black Thought. It's like if Black Thought is a samurai sword, Malik B was a Ginsu knife. And to me, those first early Roots albums, they were neck and neck. I didn't feel like Black Thought was better than Malik or Malik was better than Black Thought. I felt like, man, these are two incredible MCs. And you know, Malik, for his personal reasons and health reasons and all types of issues he had, he fell back and Black Thought picked up the mantle. But I just know as a fan of the Roots, how important he was to the development of that group. And I don't think that can be understated. Yo, can we play 100% Dundee? This is a tribute. 100% Dundee, Malik B. Rest in peace, Malik B. 100% Dundee. In the belly, whack up my celly, get known like Don Stelly. You know the dilly on the deli in the grinded up. If I said you got a bend in your kite, then send it up. You press up on your corner with windows that send it up. Lay our pots face down on the ground and give it up. Get it up. Face on the ground and give it up. What? Black Thought, I represent the 5th Dynasty, Lyrical Click. 100% on D, Malik B, I represent the B5D, Gorilla Click. 100% on D. Black Thought, I represent the 5th Dynasty, Lyrical Click. 100% on D, Malik B, I represent the B5D, Gorilla Click. 100% on D. Why you pose for pictures? I'm the invisible enigma. Down low, scope you off the roof. Mike the filler, case you up in the vocal booth, you held prisoner watch. While I'm banging out this high shift of Sigma, Illadel V8 live without a DJ. It has been that way since Sergio Valente. Yo, the rules told the dance, so he can't say. Plus the black door MC professionally. Push prints of paper like Gina Bar and Chibe. What was your assumption? I laid your function. Making a black door production. Word up, I'm on something. Tell a co I'm going blunt and travel like broadcast via satellite. LFM dynamite, lyrically calculus, and this arithmetic hip hop metropolis. All of these comedies. Oh my god! Black thought, I represent the fifth dynasty. Lyrical clip, 100% Dundee. Who are you, bro? Black thought, I represent the fifth dynasty. Lyrical clip, 100% Dundee. Who are you, bro? Who are you? Some sort of rap alien from Planet Rap. It really is a rap alien. Every time, no matter what song comes on, I don't know who you are, but take off your mask. You have a mask on right now, I know it is. Check me out, Jess. Come on, check me out. Come on, come on, check me out, Jess. Come on, yeah, come on, yeah, come on. So you were dry for 20 years? Yes. Why did you fall off? Uh, I was in a little town in Alaska. It wasn't the end of the world, but you can see it from there. And it was like all of a sudden I thought, I could drink. It's also that same thought you have if you look off a large building and go, I can fly. Mm. And within a week it was like, gone, you know. And now, you know, I realize I can't. So that was the gift, you know. So we in town together, I'm backstage, we chilling. Dave and the crew say, could we go on down and say, okay, uh, I'm going to use the bathroom. I'm right behind y'all. And, you know, they got the green room snacks. So there's cookies there, right? And everybody, anybody who know me, know my relationship with baked goods and cookies. <laughs> like, you know what I'm I seen Moses Ryder once. It had cookies and apple juice on it. I'm like, this is the squarest nigga in show business. This nigga's going to take a nap. <laughs> Hey, so I end up being in the green room, like, by myself with the cookies. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, oh, man, look at this delicious cookies. <laughs> he said it like the cookies were alive. Like, the cookies had a laminate on. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hey, you know what? I will have a cookie. I been into the cookie. I was like, it's a pretty good cookie. Then I ate the whole cookie, and it was like, you know, I have another one. Oh, oh God. I said, no. you know what? No, no, no. Then I, then I said, you know what? 
I'll come back. The cookies are here. <laughs> I'm close. <laughs> and I just go hang out with the homies that come back, have the post show cookie. This is great. So I'm all set up. Sitting in the crowd, Dave out of nowhere. I don't know if you ever even done this to anybody else, but he used to just call me on stage, which is the craziest shit because everybody knows I'm a frustrated uh, stand up comedian that got kidnapped by rap. But, that's but wait more a minute, wait a minute. Back in these days, I used to do six hour sets. I'd be on stage drinking beer and coffee and all kinds of shit. I would have to go to the bathroom. Like maybe four hours into it, I'd be like, man, I gotta go to the bathroom. I look at the crowd. And there's most just sitting there enjoying the show. I'm like, yo, I tag him in. Like, yo, hold me down. And the crowd, you guys don't mind if most depth comes up for a minute while I go to the restroom. These niggas see him, hooray! And, and so now he can't say no, right? Now, now I get off stage, I go to the bathroom, right? And I'm in the bathroom at the punchline. There's the speakers in the bathroom. This nigga, I thought he was going to rhyme or something. This nigga started doing stand-up. He went up there like, hey, waka waka, everybody. What's going on? What's going on? It's going to be here at the punchline. And, and, and was... <laughs> and and started... How long you guys been together, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the point was, he would destroy. So now this particular night, this is a big, big night. Because what we know, we know what they don't know. Robin right. Williams is backstage Williams. about to go on, and suddenly I feel the pinch, and I leave the stage. But I called most up. And I, would, I didn't know this was going to happen at all, so I'm like, oh, wow, this is a big deal. So people, they go crazy. Dave comes back, and, I, you know, and then we just start chatting on stage. People are like, so what's up? We just, just get into it. And um, I just like, you know, do your thing. I'm going to just sit here on stage. So I start sitting down on stage kind of like Indian style. And then 15, 20 minutes later, before I know it, I'm kind of, like, laid out like I'm in, like, a Renaissance painting and shit. Like, like I'm in a dorm room and shit with my fucking, like, you know, like, elbow up, you know what I'm saying, fucking legs stretched out. And I'm like, nigga, what is, why am I this relaxed? I'm like, you know what I'm saying? Still black in America? I am not feel good, but, like, I'm really relaxed out here. Public, what is going on? I don't know what's happening. I was like, why am I experiencing these feelings <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> then I realized I put it together like I'm high oh I'm high and then I put it together that it was the cookie and then right when I made the cookie connection I came up to Moses and said you passed my test <laughs> <laughs> Robin Williams comes on stage and I freaked the fuck out. I'm like, this is crazy. It was nuts. <laughs> yeah, that shit was wild. That was a good experience. Yo, and the rest in peace, Robin Williams. I got to tell you, I bumped into him at FTC on 8th Street. Then he was buying skate gear for himself. And I was like, hey, you know, it was, couldn't have been nice. I, I didn't know him that well, but I knew him from around. I said, I'm doing a show at the Punchline, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, very gracious, but didn't give me any real inclination that he'd show up. And he did. And he sat in the green room, and I could tell from his swag, oh, this nigga wants to go on. Yes. <laughs> yes. He's not here. He's, he's not here. Oh, he doesn't Come give a fuck about checking me out. He wants to go on. And 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 a lot of times in comedy, that's some some pecking order shit. Niggas feel funny if another headliner show up to this show, but not him. Yeah, that's Robin Williams. Correct. That's true. You said about some of his being on, that like people people want you to be a certain way. Sometimes you can't help but be depressed or, you know, just the nature of being. Sure. They love me, which is great. That's the simplest and most wonderful thing. That's the bottom line. That helps the most. And then the rest is up to me. I had a friend that I went to high school with that served in Afghanistan. He was a mind clearer. It was a stressful job. This nigga's from like the hood, hood in DC, but he was a visual artist and that's why we went to the same high school and he was great at his artwork, but now he was in the military. He found himself in Afghanistan. He's an officer. He reports directly to Tommy Franks, the command of the United States forces in Afghanistan, and he had to clear minds. And I remember talking to him once when he was home on leave and he said, and whenever you hear in the news that someone got killed by a landmine in Afghanistan, as bad as that feels for you, 
You don't never imagine how I feel. He tell me shit like this. I'm not staying in another man's grief, but I'm just framing the picture. And he told me one time, he said, I was out in the field, like in the field. He said, it was a stressful time. I look up, I see a white dude coming for me, and I realize it's Robin Williams. And he sat there and talked to me for 20 minutes. I never laughed so hard. He goes, Dave, if you ever meet this guy, you got to tell him what that made me feel like. Like, it really helped me get through my deployment. And I told Robin that night. I said, I have a dear friend of mine, and he, and he claims he saved his life just by being there. And he said, oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. And he gets uncomfortable with this type of compliment. And then waka waka, he goes into the jokes. But I remember, the other thing I remember about that night, Robin Williams, at that point in his career, was the kind of guy that you forget how much you like him till you see him. And when he came on that stage, man, the place went crazy. He was only 220 seats in the punchline. It sounded like 10,000. Ah, I can't remember a single joke he said. It was almost like I was just watching the crowd. It was complete glee. They were so happy to spend any time with him. And at the end of the night, it was me most and Robin on stage killing it, just like we're doing right now in a jam session, just just chomping it up. But Robin is a wild dude, and every once in a while, he pumped the tempo up. He would start like fucking, he wanted to rhyme with most, most was rhyming with him. <laughs> he, it was it was dope, though. It was wild. It, it was, most, do you have bars, most? Yo, I was just tripping, like, Robin Williams is really going for it. We're like, yo, we about to do a cypher right now. That's right. L, that's so L. It's what they call in the wine world an odd pairing. Yes, exactly, exactly. It exactly. was an odd pairing, but but it was perfect. Like, the three of us up there was perfect. And it's poignant because, sadly, that was the last time that, that we would ever see him alive. But boy, well, the last time I saw him, he was very much alive. You're back and you realize the thing that matters are others. Way beyond yourself. Self goes away. Ego, bye-bye. Realize there are a lot, a lot of amazing people out there to be grateful for. And a loving God. And that, other than that, good luck. <laughs> You know, it's good that we talked about this, you know, because, you know, sometimes people look at us like infallible, mm -hmm. like like we're not human and, and never had a life. Like there's people like are listening now that have things in their life that they have never talked about. That's right. You know, then it always helps to talk about it I, with someone. Yeah. I don't mean the world, but like, you know, but talk about stuff. You know, you, you'd be surprised. You mm -hmm. take a chance on somebody say, look, man, I, I don't, I'm not proud of this part of my life. I like to tell you, oh, rah, rah, rah. you know. Can't you see the inquirer now? Kevin Pryor confessed to sordid homosexual <laughs> past. <laughs> and, um... When you feel your life's too hard, just go have a talk with God. I don't know how to inspire anyone to live. But just live. The next time I do this show, I'll tell you how to live. And if you can hang in that long, my God, is the next time. Just live. Just live. And you can talk to him any time. He's always around. When you feel your life's too hard, just go have a talk. Midnight Miracle.